Good evening, ladies and men folk. Welcome to episode 82 of Word Ninjas Live. I am your instigator of literary and creative productivity, Charles. And joining me are my co-hosts, Justin. Powering up portals online. Yay. And Calvin. Powering up with various nuts. <laughs> it's been a long day. I can agree with that. Our other co-hosts are otherwise engaged at the moment, but hoping they can join us when available. We're going to shuffle things around a little bit with this episode and jump straight into the highlights reel, because reasons. So, time to make my face disappear and go on to screen share. But first, let's migrate it away from the show notes so no one gets spoilers. All right, we have all sorts of fun little highlights for this week because we had a whole slew of stuff in the queue, and I wanted to burn through it because some of that stuff has been sitting there for a while. So in no particular order, because I forget what the original chronological order was when I put these together, the first link is tips on writing dialogue that's truthful. Now, they use truthful. I would go more with effective and engaging but I guess their headline is a little quicker to read. It is a list of 10 tips on how to think about dialogue when putting it together. Stuff like make every word of dialogue count. That is easier said than done, considering sometimes you just need a bit of fluff dialogue to get around the more important stuff, but still worth keeping in mind. Uh, number two was readers should be able to identify who is speaking without needing to read each character heading. Characters' voices must be distinctive and not interchangeable with other characters. I wholeheartedly agree with that one, even though I am notorious for forgetting that sometimes when I'm doing blocks of dialogue in my outlining or drafting. It is very useful to have certain dialogue ticks that individual characters utilize so that you can pretty easily tell, oh, that's this character, or no, now we're on to that character. Even if they're not specifically named, they're different enough that you can start telling them apart. I had that problem while doing dysfunctional systems in the last episode when certain people started imitating others or just blatantly using other people's dialogues because it felt a bit rushed, and I was getting very confused even though that one did have the character names above it, so I don't really have much of an excuse. And their points 5, 6, 7, and 8 really all blend together because they're all about dialogue, must not sound wooden or stilted. You can use contractions, colloquialisms, slang, and so on when true to your characters. Characters can speak in verbal shorthand and... Watch out for on-the-nose dialogue, because in real life, people don't always say exactly what's on their mind or say exactly what they mean. Really, make them actual, believable people. I was about to say humans, but that's not always applicable. It doesn't have to be academic-style narration. You can actually make it sound natural and organic. That is allowed and encouraged. It makes for much more fun reading. That said, do your research. If your character is discussing certain things like medical issues or something that people will be able to tell if that's true or not or doesn't seem quite right, take the time, do the research, make sure that it sounds the way it should or at least is it close enough in line or if someone calls you out on it, you can at least explain why you did it a certain way. And the last one was just writing character biographies for all of your characters. That's really on a case-by-case -case basis. You don't have to do it for every single character, I feel like. It's just useful for your own reference if you need certain bits of information, kind of like the uh, story Bible concept. But I thought this one was interesting and worth tossing into the highlights reel because 
I enjoy writing dialogue. I enjoy writing entire pages of just dialogue because it helps me get my head around what I want these characters to be doing, but it's also useful to make the dialogue worth reading. And we're not always necessarily thinking about that, at least in the drafting process. But Yeah, one thing that stood out to me is something that I don't usually think about is um, voice identity and the idea of being able to identify your character without he said, she said, they said. Um, <clears throat> something I never really thought about and something I'll have to consider in my next uh, next writing session. That's an interesting tip. Uh, writing character biographies, I definitely do that. Uh, at least in shorthand or things that are relevant to the story. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily have a whole family tree for everything, but I definitely write some key notes. Um, maybe they're what drives them, what their goals are, um, so that when I decide what decision they're going to make, I have something to reference so that I can make sure that they their decisions always make sense. Mm-hmm. And I know one thing I've noticed, just with regular people, not even characters, most people out there have preferred swears. It's interesting to see how different people express their emotions through dialogue. So it's fun to do that with characters as well. Not everyone's going to use the exact same swear word for everything. So it's always fun to make that a little diverse as well. All right, next up is an ever-fun topic of why people get so worked up about canon. Now, I'm not going to go too into detail on this one because this is a button for pretty much everyone out there, it seems like, for either their own stories or stories they really care about. There is a lot of power behind the canon characters or canon stories, the canon universes, depending on what story you're talking about. This particular article over on Kotaku talks uh, mentions like aliens, uh, the alien aliens, and like Aliens Three, whatever that one was. And if I remember correctly, like Aliens Three kind of messed with a lot of the continuity from the first two, so a lot of people got cranky about that. But it's been like a decade since I've watched anything from that series, so if I'm mistaken, by all means, correct me. Pretty sure most diehard fans only consider the Alien franchise to be the first two movies and largely disregard the rest. (laughs) And quite frankly, I don't blame them. You mean Aliens vs. Predators isn't canon? I'm one of the rare people that actually really enjoyed those movies because they are so dumb. Wait, there was more than one? Uh, the, yes, there's AVB2. I was not aware they made a sequel. I kind of want to see that. Uh, it is interesting. <laughs> I enjoyed AVP1 as a standalone movie. I had trouble taking it into the context of the overall Alien or Predator-verse. But it was an interesting concept of how they tied the two together. I, uh, side story, probably TMI, but there's the, one of the opening scenes in AVP is when they show them crawling through the uh, ice tunnel that was carved by the giant laser, so it mm-hmm. bored this huge hole into the ground. If, do you remember that scene, CJ? Vaguely. And it was all, like, spiral cut, kind of? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I always compare that scene to how I feel after eating Taco Bell or another equivalent food stuff. Oh, my. Yes, I I use that scene as a reference. (laughs) Hopefully that is not part of the canon. I hope not. It's part of my canon. (laughs) Uh, The article also goes on to reference DC's Crisis on Infinite Earths. That one I actually appreciate because back in that time DC had a lot of characters and universes and they were a company they needed to kind of trim down and they made it work through the story of Crisis on Infinite Earths and then 
I think it was just Infinite Crises or Infinite Crisis. I forget all I know order. is that canon all the things <laughs> is basically how that starts. Yeah, well, canon the things they want to canon and obliterate the rest, pretty much. But that was one of the methods of figuring out canon going forward when it just keeps on going because it's DC, it's comics, it's the main superheroes. They're not just going to let those series die off and try and find new IPs every decade or so. And I wouldn't blame them because these are fantastic characters even though they have evolved considerably since their origins. They also go on to reference stuff like the Star Wars universe and the expanded universe, which for some is canon, but for other particular people at the moment is not. You mean Disney? Uh, I wasn't going to name names, even though they name names right here. J.J. Abrams. Well, that would be Star Trek. Oh, wait, I guess it's Star Wars 2. Yeah. yeah. But... There's actually another article that I didn't link on here. Did I? Uh, no, I did that for work. Crap. Well, if I remember to do this in the future, I'll add that link, but they're apparently making 20 books to... You did add that. That's on the list. Oh. I'll get to that later then. It's Maybe the I didn't open list. the tab. Last link. Uh, I don't have it open anymore. That's why. Well, well, we'll get to that. But yeah, they also mentioned the whole Star Star Wars verse and how it's kind of being taken apart canon-wise because reasons. A uh, series that I'm not Wait, familiar with. Wait, does that with. mean Chewbacca is alive now? Spoiler alerts. I put you on silent so you wouldn't make vibrating noises. I'm sorry. Okay. Silly phone. Um... I guess you'll have to read the 20 books to find out. Oh, yeah, only those 20 books are going to be canon. Good point. <laughs> yeah. And they, of course, mentioned the latest J.J. Abrams Star Trek reboot, which also messes with canon, because time travel. Or, as they put it here in all caps, new timeline, we can do whatever we want. And they did. They also reference stuff like Devil May Cry, the Tomb Raider series that got rebooted back in, I want to say, 09. And what else was there? I think those were the main references, but it's actually a very interesting article if you take the time to read through it. And it really discusses the details of why a lot of fans appreciate canon. Um, do, 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 do. There was an actual paragraph. The reason this is such a compelling thing, despite the surface of... Nah, no, it wasn't that one. God damn it. I should have highlighted it. It's somewhere in there. It really summed it up in a couple of sentences of why people care. But still, worth reading. Moving on. I shouldn't have been at the bottom of that one. The Doctrine of Doers, Five Principles of Achievement. Now, not writing primarily, just general productivity. This one is fun in that it's just five principles, but it really boils down to stuff that not everyone really takes into account, like being a professional isn't actually easy. Professionals make it look easy, but they've taken the time to get to that skill level. Not everyone thinks about that particular part. It takes time. And one that I don't even really think of that often but is very valid is the company you keep while becoming a professional or being productive actually does matter. If you surround yourself with people who are just as productive or trying just as hard, that really makes a big difference compared to if you're just surrounding yourself with people who don't always really give it their all or are more procrastinators than productive activity peoples. There needs to be a better term for that. And basics trump cleverness. There is a reason why 
writers specifically learn the logistics of grammar, punctuation, style, because the basics are important. They, are, they do exist for a reason. So you can understand why, when, where, all that, you can bend and break those rules. If you don't understand why the rules are there in the first place, then it's a lot easier to make mistakes. So it's actually worth doing your due diligence, doing your research, taking the time to learn properly, and then breaking all the rules as you see fit. And the fourth principle was there will be blood, which a less painful version of that would be no pain, no progress. Nothing worth doing is easy. It actually takes time, it takes effort, it takes resources, it takes sanity most of the time, and most of the time lately it takes money. So if you're not putting something into it, you're not going to get a lot out of it. And one that has tripped up a lot of people I know, myself included at times, is achievement is a process, just like productivity is a process. It is never ending. It's not just you aim towards one particular end goal, you reach it, and then that's it, you're done. You don't have to do anything ever again. It keeps going until you die. And then presumably there's an afterlife and you get to do even more in that life. So it really is never ending. And of course, you can read the full article for their very entertaining narrative explaining their version of why these five principles are important. I just wanted to do a quick highlight of them because I was very entertained by it. Next up is an article discussing why publisher revenues are down as ebook buying slows. I mainly clicked on this one because I was intrigued by the headline because it felt a little grammatically incorrect, but also why are ebook sales going down? I thought those would be going up lately, considering ebook prices I felt were going down, and there's continuously more and more content available to a wider range of people out there, so what's going on? Well, apparently this is focusing primarily on the traditional publishers, and their ebook sales are going down because there's other competitors out there. There's places like Amazon, which are not factored into traditional publishers. And there's stuff like indie publishers, self publishers. Those people are taking a larger and larger cut out of the traditional publishers' uh, range. I'm blanking on the term I want to use here. But it's interesting to see that the growth of self-publishing really is making a significant dent in the traditional publishing revenue. But it's not as devastating as... It's not overall devastating as I feel like this article wants it to be because as a self-published indie author, the traditional publishing industry is not really keeping up with the growth of technology and the, the diversity of what just regular people can do nowadays. We don't have to go to one of the big three publishers are there now. Three or four, I forget who's merged with what. Offhand, I feel like we're down to three at this point. And those three own a majority of the smaller publishing imprints, so those don't really factor into this because they all just trickle up to the main publishers. I had more on this topic, but people have let me talk too long, and now I lost it. People should interrupt me every once in a while. Can you hear me? Very quietly. How about now? Better. Now? Good. Um, I was actually trying to interrupt you in the uh, last the uh, the last uh, site you were talking about, but it's neither here or there. And also, I forgot what I was going to say. But for this one, anyway, this seems a lot like the 
like this really very much mirrors the whole uh, music industry argument about how uh, record sales have been going down due to technology. Am I the only one that feels that way? Uh, my immediate thought would be websites like uh, Bandcamp, SoundCloud, all the websites where people can post up their own music without having to go to a record publisher person. Right. So yeah. Yeah, I think I think issues like Spotify is a slightly different animal uh, compared to what this article is talking about about uh, people being able to self distribute. Uh, but that is also decreasing sales, obviously. But, you know, it's interesting. Something that I've been thinking about for a long time is how the, uh, how would I say, the oversaturation of availability of information and the fact that we are all cooped up in our rooms, largely not going outside a whole lot. Um, not everybody, but the, the the trend has ticked more in that direction. Uh, what's interesting is that if you don't go outside and you don't engage with other people, you still have a desire for human interaction and human connection. And what that leads you to do is go find your uh, person that is more... Uh, active and personable. So you're no longer looking for a uh, blank giant publisher that p plops out 10,000 books a year. You're looking for the independent guy that you can talk to and interact with about his book and then, you know, uh, kickstart his project or her project or... Uh, and this isn't just books. This is basically everything. Uh, a lot of things have come down to personality and people trying to connect on a human and emotional level with people uh, while they're online. Uh, and so I think that since people are looking for... People are looking to be a part of a smaller audience specifically so that they can be more interacting with the person that they're interested in. And while there's a level of narcissism there, I think it's probably more of a desire to interact. Uh, and I think you see that in publishing. I think you see that in your sound clouds. Um, and uh, other medium as well. I wonder how websites like YouTube and Vimeo factor into such things for just the social aspect, because there's a lot of book tubers, as they call themselves on YouTube. Some, some are authors, some just promote actual books, so I'm curious if that actually has an effect at all. I, I'm sure it's, it does, similar to, uh, you know, game streaming uh, and reviews and Twitch. Uh, all of that is, oh, uh, come party in this, uh, in this chat room where we can talk about the host and talk about uh, each other and content and sort of interact live while something's actually going on. Instead of the passive, hey, let's go to the local bookstore and wander around aimlessly until we find something that looks interesting based on the cover and the back sheet. Um, and it's sort of letting go and letting somebody else guide you and finding your own reviewer uh, on whatever medium that you're looking for. So, yeah, I, I agree that those are definitely playing a role. Yay, we're making a difference. Hopefully. Maybe. Possibly. We'll, we'll see. Hopefully it's a positive difference. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I think it's an interesting paradigm shift, nonetheless. All right. Moving on to the next one is a summary of various typographic websites. I don't really have much commentary on this one other than I'm just fascinated by different type fonts lately. Did you Maybe. find this uh, website because it has the word wolf in the URL by any chance? Uh, no, I didn't notice that until after I'd already read through half of it. This is this was in my scoop it feed, I think because of my writing stuff. 
but it's just a series of various websites and the particular fonts that they happen to use and a bit of commentary as to why some work and all that. And it is interesting to really look into the fonts that are out there and how some of them really work for particular design aesthetics and whatnot. I know for full coverage writers, we've been through, I think, four or five fonts at this point. And we keep on seeming to think that the latest one is the best one ever, and mainly because that's true, but it's fun. And as writers, it's interesting to see how all the different sans serifs and serifs and different styles and adaptations of older fonts really do look different and kind of give off a different personality. I kind of feel like, at least for us anyway, we've gone through as many fonts as we did because we've gone through so many like identity changes over the last, God, has it been six years now? Yeesh. <laughs> Good Lord, we're old. <laughs> and I think that's also akin to us trying to find our voice and our personalities over the years. That said, I like I really think the fonts that we're using now aren't really doing as much justice. <laughs> but maybe that's just me. I think the problem is, for us anyway, we're trying to use one or two fonts to do everything, but we're not just one thing anymore. We've really right. branched out lately. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that one, so... Do you ever have I, the desire to make your own font? Yes. Uh, I posted about that on Tumblr, actually. I really want to try that. There's there's software out there, but they range in price and in learning curve. And that's been the one thing that has kept me from trying to work on this one font I've been wanting to do for maybe about four, four or five years now. And I still want to do it. I still have the desire to do it. I like Whenever I'm on the train, I still... like see all the signs and things that inspired me to want to work on this one to begin with. And so that, that is, that's one of the things on my to-do list to get that font going. I'm surprised there's no... Oop, my camera's off. <laughs> uh, I'm surprised there's no methodology of just making a bunch of, like, vector graphics fonts and, like, importing a bunch of them into your own font thing. Instead of making a font program from the ground up, just converting a bunch of uh, vector graphics files. Um, importing vector graphics is, is just one, like, that. there is a possibility to do that. There are some programs that do allow you to do that, but that's only part of the many things that you have to deal with when creating a font. It, the, it is a very involved process. People go to school for, for typography because it, like, there's things you, you have to like, study for years to really understand the concepts behind. And that's also one of the reasons why it's taking, like, taking me this long to try to uh, put my idea together because there's such an involved process. Like you, you have all the vector, like you have the general idea, you have everything drawn more or less the way you like. And then you have to import it into the the program, and then you have to go through the process of uh, getting the kerning and the the kerning, the letting, and all the tracking and everything. And then you there's all the uh, quality control to make sure that it looks good on both print, screen, and everything in between. Yeah, that cross-functionality of a font is the biggest hurdle I have seen in 
so many things. I went to a. Uh, I once went to a. Uh, a, uh, a speaking engagement where the creator of uh, Neutroface, which is what we use for the full coverage writers logo, uh, he he did a uh, he did a presentation on his uh, like some of the things like some of the uh, fonts he's worked on and what has been involved in the process and how many people it takes just like just between design and quality control and fuck <laughs> uh, just like, for the record how do you actually pronounce that font name uh, Neutraface it, it's, it was named after a, uh, an architect named uh, uh, Richard Neutra uh, German architect. I've continuously pronounced it Nutraface, but then again, everyone knows me and my pronunciations on things. Uh, don't feel bad. There's a lot of people that get that one wrong. Also, I, the I Dr. Have... Seuss debacle. So people pronounce names wrong constantly, and you shouldn't feel bad all the time. Dr. Seuss has gotten his due. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, typography is quite a beast, mm. and you have to like you have to be ready for like if you're ready if you're ready for like that amount of commitment. <laughs> I imagine it's definitely worth it, especially if you, like you're like, really the creative type. And like thinking about how much goes into creating a font, I understand wholeheartedly why they're so expensive now. <laughs> what was our older font that we used to use? What um it had a year number in it. Um what was it, one of the eight million Gaudi uh yeah. fonts? <laughs> I think that's what we used in the book. And for the book, like anyone's going to be able to actually read that usefully, but that serif in the book works really well, but not really anywhere else anymore. <laughs> well, uh, We've kind of serifs. outgrown it, I feel like. Like we've, <clears throat> excuse me, we've, uh, we've definitely moved on from a lot of typefaces. Just for, just from dealing with identity issues and like feeling like feelings and like what we're trying to convey in uh, various me in various media, but uh, it's it's definitely one thing to note that like most serif uh, most uh, serif fonts were really meant for print and print only. Like sans serifs, uh, sans serifs came in, like probably became more prominent because of the advent of computers and and uh, the various screens and being able and being able to deal with uh, readability in various super low things. DPI and yes, precisely. Serifs uh, have ser trouble on low DPI screens. <laughs> yeah, serifs do do not handle well on uh, low DPI screens. Is that going to be much of an issue even nowadays, let alone going forward, considering there's continuously higher res screens on everything? No, because you also have to consider screen size and the amount of texture displaying on the screen. You know, even if you have a super high DPS screen, uh, if you're, for mobile applications, if you're looking at text on mobile, uh, you have to take into consideration that the screen itself is actually small and how much they're trying to read, how many words they're trying to fit onto one, you know, six-inch diameter screen. That's right. Fair point. And unfortunately, you still have a lot of people that um, use, like, 1024 by 768 screens. 
there's a lot of people out there. Like they're slow. Like those people are slowly being weeded out, but they still exist. Yeah, that's why fixed width URL rule of thumb is like 720 pixel width because of all yeah. those awful people. Hmm. I never thought about that. Like it's the it's like the whole late adopter uh, rule of thumb when it comes to like a lot of different technology, like advents of new technology. Not everybody is gonna adopt it. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, adopt it as quickly as other people. And there's gonna be people that will just be just stubborn about it. <laughs> Well, they're going to have a harder time if companies like Apple or Microsoft have anything to say about it. Mm. I loved Microsoft's latest uh, campaign during one of their presentations, basically showing Windows 10 nice and, no nice and new and shiny, and then Windows 7, which was <laughs> look, the equivalent of an Apple 3C. I'm not sure what the Microsoft equivalent would be because I didn't have a computer that old back then that was Mac or Windows. Um, anyone else have a relevant equivalent computer for back in the day? Probably like a like an old Tandy or something. <laughs> yeah, basically. That's what they equate Windows 7 to. <laughs> so yeah, I saw that 486 one. to, huh? And I mean, it <laughs> makes a point, and that... Didn't they effectively skip Windows 9? Yeah, there are uh, yes, they did, actually. certain reasons for that. Um, yeah, they actually explained in the presentation the uh, breakdown of why some of the psychology behind that was. A lot of programs still use Windows 9 asterisk for search terms to see which right. Windows program you have installed. And if you have 95 and 98, it will do this set of DLL files. And all it looks is, is for Windows... 9 Astrid. Windows 9X, yeah. <laughs> I feel like at this point, if you're running off of anything pre-XP, that's impressive. Well, there's a lot of old-ass programs that are being run constantly. Uh, you know, I'm sure the government and any financial databases are in, you know, God knows, might not even be as recent as not Windows 95. I but hope it's 3.1. The best I one? I actually uh, once worked for a company that had an old piece of machining equipment that re only ran on Windows 3.0. <laughs> so they had one PC in the company that had Windows 3.0 on it just so they could use that piece of machining equipment. We nice. had a computer in our office that, while not that old, it was more like early Pentium era, we could not get rid of because it was the only computer that ran Fortran natively uh, without emulation. And uh, we weren't able to shut the computer off because if we shut it off, it wouldn't turn back on. Oh. <laughs> so that was interesting. We eventually <laughs> lit that computer on fire and threw it out the window. <laughs> so you went office space on it pretty much? Yeah, basically. So I don't feel so bad that a lot of the computers at my office still run Windows XP. I should count my lucky stars in that case. Yeesh. I think I'm only on Windows 7 because that's what came with the PC laptop I have. I preferred XP, but I'm one of those stubborn people. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I preferred XP for a long time as well, mainly because Vista was so terrible. <laughs> oh, God, I, blank I blacked Vista out of my memory. <laughs> Um, a lot of us did. I was a Vista early adopter. I was all into Arrow. This was back in the day where pretty flashing things amused me. And make all the things transparent. Uh, got my rocks off. So I was all in. And, oh, oh, by the way, uh, animated backgrounds, which were basically looping uh, AVIs, or probably mm. GIFs, uh, and uh, what they didn't tell you is that your computer basically uh, died because if you ran any of these features on the current hardware that was out. Like, 
Arrow and like animated desktop backgrounds took up a good 50% of your computer's resources. Yeah. Like Arrow was such a clutch uh, when it first came out. Like, oh, it was painful, man. <laughs> but hey, I, I've had I had better experiences with uh, Windows Vista than I did with Windows Millennium Edition. I oh, I have that one. That one. Uh, that one was special. I had an old laptop that I have from my dad, and it ran Windows ME on it, and. That laptop died because it was running Windows ME. Like <laughs> ME crashed so frequently that it it fried all the hardware in that laptop. That's impressive. That laptop gave up on life because of Windows ME. I will never forget that. Worst kernel ever. <laughs> I'm still trying to forgive Microsoft for that one. I think that's why I've gone... I just skip a generation of the OS. Sometimes, too, depending on how long I hold on to a computer. Probably for the best. Hmm. All right, I think that it was a long enough derailment. I'm going to wrap up the highlights reel. Let's see. First, I'm going to add the tab that I apparently forgot. And then back to the screen share. No, not that. What? Oh, that's why. So apparently I didn't copy and paste the link properly because I'm smart. Uh... Spoilers. Oh, let's cheat. This was not the link, but it'll do. So it was recently announced that there are 20 new Star Wars books coming out that are hopefully going to help fill in the gap between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens. And hopefully this takes the place in an adequate manner of the expanded universe, which apparently is no longer canon to the cinematic universe. Because reasons. I'm curious just what they're going to put in the 20 books. Like, how much are they going to have to fill in to cover, I guess, 32 years of space-time in the cinematic verse? Because that's a lot of stuff that happened. And a lot of stuff that theoretically at least has been touched upon in the Expanded Universe. I'm not sure because I have not read a majority of the Expanded Universe at this point. I am very out of date on that. I think it's probably been 12 years since I've read a Star Wars book. So I am by no means an authority on this one. But I'm curious, is how many authors are they going to get in on this? How are they going to space them out in uh, release time? Because they only have so much time before The Force Awakens actually comes out in theaters. Are they going to get all 20 books out before then? Or is it going to be an ongoing process? I'm curious what the full deal is here. And I'm curious to the various Star Wars fans out there, viewers and listeners and whatnot, what your opinions on this are. Are you going to read any of the 20 books coming out to see how they take this on? Are you just going to leave it be? Are you going to shake your fist angrily at J.J. Abrams? Post in the comments. And the last highlight from the highlights reel is a Patreon from one of our friends that we met at Inconceivable, Heather Hutzel. And I believe we even had on the show for an interview, from what I remember. I don't remember offhand which episode that was, though. 
But she's apparently started up a Patreon because she has four more books and four more short stories that she has in the works that she's hoping to get self-published and out there this year. And I'm pretty sure she's going to be at Inconceivable this year as well. So get to look forward to seeing her again. And I'll fix the links in the show notes so by the time you check all this out, it'll be proper. But those, come on, off of screen share, damn it. Those are your highlights for the week. And now that we have Will, we can go to the talkie point for the week. I returned. Yay. So what are we talking about this week? Okay, this was just... uh a little character development thing that popped in my head because it came in my head and I realized this is a thing that's happening in my head and this is actually really helpful for developing my character. So I figured I'd share it. Uh, basically a bit of a what-if scenario. Uh, what if your original characters, for whatever story you're writing, were to sit down and play a Dungeons & Dragons style tabletop game? It doesn't have to necessarily be Dungeons and Dragons specifically, but anything along that lines where you get pretty much free reign to make your own characters and develop your own story, and some one guy plays the dungeon master, guild master, god type character, and then throws your characters characters into a world. There's a little meta there, your character's characters. And uh, I thought it was an interesting take because a lot of people, real people, as we all here know, since we've all been through it, when we design our characters for a Dungeons & Dragons type game, it's based off our own interests because we're given pretty much full free reign to make a character how we want, with the personality quirks that we want, and the alignments that we want. And it says a lot about our own personalities and characteristics and what we're like when we're given free reign. And I think so that's like, an interesting take for seeing how your characters would act and might discover something you may or may not want to know about your own characters. Like but, how uh, my starting equipment for my character for our D&D campaign, one of the items is a bottle of wine. Exactly. That, that is exactly correct. I want to add <laughs> immunity to glue traps to my character, please. Oh, my God. Can I add immunity traps to, for his character? <laughs> I'll split the cost of immunity to glue traps. You keep that up, and I'll give you uh, vulnerability to glue traps for all of you. No. <laughs> I'm vulnerable enough as it is. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> what brought this up is that I, I was going through some of my own characters, letting them play in my head, and I realized some of them would play Dungeons & Dragons. So I, in my head, they were designing their characters and how they would take the game. Because not only your characters matter in the game, but how you play the game matters. Some people are really big into role-playing. Some people are really big into the story immersion. Some people only care about the dungeon crawling, getting the trophies, the rewards, things like that. The leveling up system. Then you have your min-maxers, the people who only care about the stats. There's the people that agree with the DM on everything. There are the people that fight with the DM on everything. And then there are people that are sitting on the side just eating Doritos and having a good time and laughing at all the drama. <laughs> I thought they preferred Cheetos. Cheetos, Doritos, Fritos, as long as there's Mountain Dew. I was going to say, the Doritos <laughs> have to come with the Mountain Dew. <laughs> so, uh, it was just an interesting little take. I saw that some of you people have wrote down, written down, wrote down. Yeah, some ideas I put down for notes so I wouldn't forget. And also, which which characters would willingly play the game, and which ones would have to be coerced? <laughs> <laughs> I did not take that into consideration. I had a couple. Like, if I was to look at just Max and Aiden, Aiden would probably play. He'd be interested in the story. He'd probably pull some kind of tank class, like a paladin probably be good so that he's not too in line with lawful good but would want to help people and he would be pretty quiet about it, maybe get a little bit into the role play but definitely get into he would be the guy that would read all the books to learn about the world but then when you make him role play he wouldn't really know what to say 
But he loved the lore and the story of the world, even though he is more of a sci-fi guy than a fantasy guy. But they do have sci-fi version tabletop games. And then if you had Max, she would not want to play at all. She wouldn't be interested until you told her that there's a bard class that relies on singing and dancing. <laughs> then maybe she'd be interested. <laughs> but she'd need a lot of help. <laughs> Probably best the DM make her character for her. <laughs> Well, I have six characters, so it got kind of complicated, which is why I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. You have enough for a whole party to play a game all on their own. Yeah, <laughs> and it, with your commentary, it comes to mind that Slash would definitely be the most enthusiastic. He would probably be the DM, but if you were to have a playable character, he'd definitely be chaotic good and choose either a fighter or a ranger or try to meld the two. Which is doable. Mm. Yay, hybrid classes. <laughs> uh, Shadow would just be neutral evil and probably go for the druid class and he'd be one of the quieter characters. He'd play just because everyone else is. Burn would definitely be chaotic neutral and go for the mage and just set everything on fire. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> uh, Ivy would also be chaotic neutral just because of burn, but she'd go for the cleric and make sure that if anything is set on fire that may die, it doesn't. <laughs> Important. <laughs> yeah. Adeara would just be chaotic neutral and go for the scion and have a lot of fun interacting with the NPCs and then mind-controlling them to get the upper hand. <laughs> Do a lot of bartering and arguing with the DM about getting the better price and stuff, I'm sure. And then Kemion would just be the lawful evil warlord, and he'd be the one who would purposefully help the DM to try and get a TPK, just to be an ass. I can already tell that he would be a jerk about everything and try to break the world if possible. There's always one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I want all six of those characters to play together, though. That would not end well. That would break something. That would be half the fun. Ugh. It would probably be a great read. Uh, maybe it'll be a flash fic or some such. We'll see. <laughs> Careful, you, you know not to use the word flash fake in this uh, podcast. You know what comes out of that when you remind people. I got nothing against the flash fake genre. It's the slash fic mm. where things get a little weird. So, uh, my characters, I, I took this in a different direction. Since As my characters do. already live in a fantasy world... I decided that when they play D&D, it would not be a fantasy D&D. It would be a normal uh, Western life D&D. So, like, your, your character, Mike, uh, you know, Iron Crutchley would be the DM because he's kind of the old de facto leader guy. And then, like, Kyle Lau would be the uh, project manager. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, all, all other characters would be, like, tech support. And, uh, you know, uh, what's the one where you deal with people? HR. Yeah, human resources. I definitely have oh. a human resources character. Uh, so, yeah, I just uh, I thought that that would be an interesting twist. I like that. Played I some like sort that of, like, business. Roll a d20 to see if I... you file your paperwork in on time. Correct. Yep. Oh, you only rolled an A. Oh, looks like you're getting a demotion next month. Yeah. Instead of monsters, you have clients. <laughs> <laughs> clients are monsters. <laughs> Your TPS report was not filed correctly. You lose. If the company files bankruptcy, that'd be a TPK. <laughs> mm. um, as for me, as for my character... I figured it took me a while. It took me a bit to think about, but uh, it seems like uh, Kane would most likely be a uh, chaotic neutral blood mage. 
like especially like, especially given his personality like very unpredictable n- like not a terrible person but not very nice either and i'm um, i'm also wondering if he if he actually would play D&D like he probably would but he's really not the type to have a whole lot of friends not not just that not because he doesn't like people he likes people it's just people are very apprehensive about him for like for a very good reason <laughs> So it kind of so it kind of made sense that uh, <clears throat> like at the very least chaotic neutral would uh, would be would be a good fit for him and him being able to uh, wield magic at his very whim yeah that sounds pretty dangerous thinking about this character <laughs> yep I yep I definitely chose correctly on this one. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is a whole build of sorcerer that relies on chaos magic. I think I almost went down that route, but then my car- character was complicated enough as it was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm well, already a bard server. <clears throat> the bard, yeah. Oh, the bard server. <laughs> I I (laughs) (laughs) At least I had the wherewithal to retreat when you got captured. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, you had the wherewithal to leave the bard server behind and save your own hide. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) What, did I live? Yes. True. (laughs) Chaotic neutral. (laughs) But you also didn't complete the quest, therefore you're not going to get paid when you get back to town. Yeah, whatever. I didn't spend many resources. <laughs> I still got plenty of arrows. <laughs> but yeah, just if any of you at home listening in have any ideas for... And again, not just D&D. There are, I can't think of any of the names of other ones, but I know there are a lot of other tabletop games like them. Werewolf. Sure. But uh, feel free to comment about what type of characters your characters would make and how they would play the games, if they would play at all, if they might need some coercion, or if they'd be the one saying, hey, everybody, I have something new to play. <laughs> all this makes me think of is Tiny, Tiny Tina's DLC in Borderlands 2. That was a pretty good example because you had um, Lilith, Mordecai, and Brick all kind of showing different mentalities of that. Like, the developers of Borderlands 2 put some thought into that with Lilith apparently being the veteran player who had played before and was very big onto keeping things canon and having things making sense. And whenever things got a little crazy, she kind of threw a little hissy fit. (laughs) You can't do that. I don't care if it's fun. You can't do that. It doesn't make sense. You had Brick, who was surprisingly the one who was having the most fun. He, he just rolled right into it like, yes, we're doing this, this is the thing we're doing, and this is going to be awesome, let's get to fighting and killing dragons. <laughs> and then you had Mordecai, who was just playing because everyone else was playing. <laughs> and I know there's also a post going around equating all of the Avengers to playing Guardians of the Galaxy as D&D. And that one was actually very good in how they equated each Avengers to the character in Guardians of the Galaxy and why they would play that particular character the way they did. Nice. It's a lot of fun. AU world building, (laughs) always a good thing. Mm. Mm-hmm. All right, onwards to the productivity and inspiration station segment thing. All right, Uh, I'm going to still count it as productivity, but I bought more books. Why? Why? (laughs) 
<laughs> because Stop. they were there. No. They were calling to me. No, they weren't. <laughs> You're not allowed to buy any more books until you finish one book. And then you can buy one book to replace it. Your queue can get no longer. But books. No. <laughs> no. Well, I'm currently reading three of them at once. So. No. What? I'm not allowed to multi-read? No. <laughs> Why? No. You'll never get any of them done. But, I mean, one's at the New York office, one's at the Wilton office, one's here. Well, two are here. I'm pretty sure you have a messenger bag. <laughs> yeah. That's Your for more books. Your bag sometimes holds various things of various rectangular size. It's all the other books he's reading right now. Yeah. <laughs> and like in it. Mm. Now, is at least one of them nonfiction? Uh, all four of them are. Okay, I can see reading nonfiction books in parallel. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I'm reading two Hesse books that actually actually align with each other. I wasn't expecting that. And then I'm also reading A Story of Women, Power, and Intrigue in the Italian Renaissance. Because why not? That doesn't really tie into anything else I'm reading. Okay, as long as they're nonfiction, I won't give you as much credit. <laughs> Stop. No more buying books. You're done. <laughs> am, you off. am I allowed to reread a book? No. Along, but <laughs> nope. But I need to. <laughs> no, you don't. None of that is true. But but it's there. <laughs> nope. Give it to me. But this is my signed copy. I'm not sharing this one. This one's mine. <laughs> right into the garbage. <laughs> Sorry, various authors. I mean, granted, I am going to buy the boxed set once I get my gift card, finally. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine what that's going to sound like to our audio listeners that didn't get the video. Like pure human suffering, I think. <laughs> if I have the auto, uh, the uh, audio editing for this episode. I'll make sure to sound as demonic and suffering able as possible. Put a little reverb in there. Auto tune it. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I actually got a byline at work that apparently went over surprisingly well, so I'm rather happy about that. Stop! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what? I appreciate my writing being appreciated. Although only does only the designers actually noticed that I put a Lord of uh not Lord of Legend of Zelda reference in there. Lord of Zelda would be weird. Hmm. What it would be. What, are you writing a Lord of the Rings Legend of Zelda crossover fic? No. <laughs> Just to be fair, that would actually be interesting. <laughs> depending on how you do it. The one Triforce. And to counter all of that, I have... I think last week I talked about how I was writing my trilogy out in scenes and being all happy about it. Well, after that, I didn't get anywhere. So I really need to f try some other tactics to keep these stories going because I'm still excited about them, and I really want to get them down on paper, but the whole transferal from brain to Google Drive has been frustrating. Hey, how did Will fare this week? Uh, I'm here. Uh, so I, 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 I mentioned before that the uh, chapter 28 of Roommate that I had completely written, written, I have also completely scrapped. And I have started rewriting that chapter from the beginning with a completely new direction that will actually lead towards, uh, 
something relevant <laughs> under this new mentality of, oh yeah, the story has to end at some point and I should work towards the ending. <laughs> so yay for progress on that. I also edited my first Word Ninjas Live podcast and I think it went over pretty well, so I feel accomplished for that. Yeah, I thought it went well, and it went up yesterday. Hmm. So we now, now doubled the output of our backlog posting. Now I have the interesting challenge this week to do both the next Word Ninjas Live for next Tuesday as well as the Not Suitable for Word Ninjas, which comes out on Sunday. Fun. <laughs> but at to. least you have a couple of days where you don't need to record Game Break. True. So... I'm not foreseeing any real trouble with that. But I think I also may still be dealing with some kind of cold because Ooh. I mostly got over it, but every now and then I still feel achy and unhappiness in the face. It took me about a month to get over it after the initial outbreak. That's longer than I want to spend fighting this cold. <laughs> it tailed off really slowly. I'll but I, drink... it did get progressively better. It's definitely better. I'll have to drink more of this tea we got, this uh, wild sweet orange tea. It is like hot, toasty orange juice with tea. My so... peppermint tea with honey was what I took, so I highly recommend lots of tea. Yes. And definitely honey. Yep. The honey is good in the orange tea. So Especially that's when it's from Taiwan. I don't think this is from Taiwan. It's made by Tazo, so I doubt it's from Taiwan no. at all. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> as as honey. <laughs> I don't know where it's from, but, but I doubt it's Taiwan. Maybe the little... No. Nope. It just says Tazo. Orange tea. But that's pretty much all I got that I could think of. Because my brain has also been a little bit like a sieve lately. Uh, how did Justin fare? I actually did a lot, and a lot is not even on this list that I just remembered. I was more productive than I thought. Uh, over the weekend, I spent a few hours in a uh, in a cafe-like establishment and uh, set up shop and did a bunch of work. I planned out some layout uh, pros and cons for the new websites that are coming out. I did some research on the business and financial management side of things and documented some of those. And then the day after that, I went over to a friend's house for what I call Productivity Day. CJ's been to a Productivity Day. It was very productive. Uh, so I went and did that with a friend and got a whole bunch of stuff done on a website that I'm working on. Because now that I'm done with a one website, I can work on two others in parallel. Uh, so, yeah, I got a lot of work done over the weekend. As far as work is concerned, I did a lot of project management. Not a whole lot of billable work. Falling a bit behind there. Uh, I think I can catch up, especially if I work all weekend. Hopefully it won't come down to that. And it will be optional. So, not a big deal. Uh, I'm back in business now that I'm not sick anymore. I'm back to working out, doing my Mandarin lessons, and enjoying the oncoming springtime. Snow is melting. It's not going to snow ever again, uh, except this weekend, briefly. But then it will turn to rain instantly. So it'll be fine, right? Sure. Uh, let's see. Started working on the project website. Oh, set up a new workflow for a website that is not through Tumblr. That's just standard, hand-coded. Uh, static pages hosted on a server somewhere. Uh, also, yesterday I purchased uh, City City Skylines because I wanted a city builder that wasn't from a large corporate publisher that ruins everything that they touch. And then closed down the studios that are famous for those things that they produce that suck. Uh, and uh, so live streaming on that is imminent, and I'm also staying home this weekend. I have no plans, and if somebody says, hey, you want to hang out, I'm going to say no. I'm going to be home all weekend, uh, live streaming, 
video games, doing some game break stuff, uh, being productive around the house, uh, maybe spend another night in or another day in an unnamed uh, establishment doing productivity stuff. So, yeah, it's going to be great. And uh, hopefully next week I can uh, keep going on my productivity. Nice. So do you want to hang out this weekend and buy some more books? Yes, semicolon no. (laughs) And how about the Calvin? So over the weekend, I bought a thing. You bought a thing? I bought a thing. A thing that will hopefully help me uh, deal with a lot of... uh, uh, basically help me organize all the things that I deal with and in turn help me organize a lot more. I'm going to screen share. Let's see if it works. Lord help me share. Can you all see it? I currently see blackness. There we <clears throat> go. Hey, it's a whiteboard. Bought me a massive whiteboard to hang up on my wall, and uh, it's going. It's going to be my. Uh, it's going to double as a boon of productivity and inspiration. If you can see, I have. I uh, drew two uh, two logos on the uh, top corners. One is mine, one's the Inspire the Muse logo. And in the middle is a uh, is where I'm gonna put various quotes to try to uh, try to remain uh, remain inspired and uh, try to find things to keep positive about uh, a lot of things that have been going on lately. And so far, it has worked tremendously. Hooray! My biggest issue was like trying to juggle all the eight million things that I do in a given week, and just forgetting a lot of them. Like everything, just I think just being overwhelmed with kind of overwhelmed with everything, I would tend to forget uh, forget things here and there and with this whiteboard I can lay everything out uh, work out scheduling and uh, timing of timing and prioritizing that's what I'm uh, that's what I wanted to say uh, prioritizing and just realizing that I haven't bitten off more than I can chew. <laughs> <laughs> And so I'm pretty happy with it. Cool. And also while I was at the uh, place I purchased that whiteboard, it was it was a Michaels. I had no idea there was a Michaels in Manhattan. I'm very happy. There's a Michaels in Manhattan? Manhattan? Yes, there is. Where? Um, 22nd and 6th. Damn, that's unnecessarily close to the New York office. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost as dangerous as a barcade. <laughs> so, I uh, ended up purchasing this whiteboard, um, various colorful markers, as you can see on the uh, lower right-hand side, and a bunch of different pens to uh, tinker around with maybe doing some drawing or calligraphy uh, or the like. Nice. Things to be more creative. So, um, I'm pretty happy with all my purchases for various reasons. Hmm. That board has brought me a lot of peace of mind. Which is always Honestly. useful. Yes. <laughs> and I think I may have inspired one of my friends to possibly purchase a whiteboard because he does a lot of uh, 
um, a lot of there's a lot of things he does uh, outside of his job, and he's been trying to find a way to organize his goings on, and so. Uh, this uh, this inspired him to look into a whiteboard. Like, it's just something so simple, but it's just fantastically effective. I don't want to hop on to the uh, inspiration to get a whiteboard train, but one thing that I never considered about the use of a whiteboard is putting inspirational stuff on it. I use my whiteboard mainly as a giant piece of graph paper where I or lined paper where I write down bulleted lists and stuff. I've never actually used it to be open and draw crap on it and write quotes and make little notes to myself. I might try that. Yeah, I, have a, I have a whiteboard like right here that's not being used because I'm not using a whiteboard for productivity. Why don't I use it for just uh, messing around and getting the creative juices flowing? I like it. Yeah, go for it, man. Go for it. I know I have two small whiteboards, but they're currently in the gigantic pile of booth stuff that is no longer relevant or used. <laughs> I may have to snag those next time I'm back up that way. I think I know where they are. I'm sure Ed would be more than happy to throw them back at me. Probably. <laughs> so... Yeah, this whiteboard has worked out very well, and I have it uh, hanging right over my bed, so I can I can always keep it uh, handy for whenever I'm uh, sitting on my bed being productive. I can always look up, or even if I'm sitting at this desk, I can always look behind me and uh, see what I, see all the things I need to take care of. Still got I got a nice bit of things to work on, but. It doesn't seem all that daunting anymore. I should use my whiteboard as a partition in the bed to keep my wife on her side of the bed and stop <laughs> stealing all the blankets. Inspire her to share the bed with you. Nope. When, when we get a house, we're going to get two separate beds. So romantic. <laughs> Hey, that'll be fun for the moments where uh, you guys happen to be in the mood to put the beds together. Just like in the 50s. I should put one of the beds on casters. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was, that's was that been uh, my inspiration for this week. Perhaps this may inspire others. Back to my face. Back to the whiteboard. <laughs> oh. <laughs> on that note, let's move on to events. Uh, we have made a couple updates to the events section, so you'll see those changes in the show notes accordingly. We have officially confirmed... or. We're 90% confirmed for attending Book Expo. We're fully confirmed for Kineticon as vendors. We're fully confirmed as vendors for Inconceivable. We are confirmed as vendors for Hartford Comic Con. Yeah. And there are a few others that we're still trying to finagle and figure out just how it's going to work or not. But I'm pretty sure at the moment those are the events we are going to just do for the year. I don't foresee us adding anything else unless we get a giant influx of revenue or something to allow for such things. So if you are in the area, definitely check out the events section so you know where we'll be when so you can come say hello to us in person. And I think that's a show. I think that's all we've got this time round. So closing out, if we have entertained you in any way, shape, or form, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch, comment, and thumbs up all of our various videos. I have also updated our About Us section on there with our current release schedule of what's going up which days. 
So you can check that out and keep aware of what type of uh, videos are going up each day. If you want to chat to us via social media, our Twitter is at FC Word Ninja, and you get bonus points if you use the hashtag Word Ninjas. You can also follow us on Tumblr, fcwordninja.tumblr.com, or go like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash fullcoveragewriters. Converse with us, talk to us, continue our conversations and dialogues and arguments and whatnot. Or send us ideas of what you'd like us to talk to about. Send us questions, uh, link various interesting articles to us. All that good stuff. And if you want to help fund any of our various endeavors, go peruse our Etsy store, which is etsy.com slash shop slash full coverage writers. We have all sorts of shiny baubles over there, managed by Ed. And all purchases help pay for stuff like our audiobook recording costs, convention attendance and coordination, a few tech and recording upgrades, and domination through the global domination not just regular domination, that would be a little weird, through the written, written word. You know, I have this whole spiel written out. You'd think I'd be able to actually say it without fumbling. Hopefully Will will be kind and actually cut some of that fumbling out. Maybe. But with that, it's time to let everyone know who we were and where they can track us down individually on the internet. If you want to talk to me, you can most likely track me down on my personal Tumblr, which is just fancypantswolf.tumblr.com. If you want to keep track of my progress on the trilogy, it's slashandburntrilogy.tumblr.com. And 50-50 shot if you'll spot me on the Fairy Tale podcast as Mokaroff on Monday nights at 10 p.m. on their YouTube channel. Will, where can people find you? Most people can find me on my Tumblr page at darkom.tumblr.com. That is D-A-R-K-H-O-M. It's a good place to reach me if you have any questions or comments about writing or whatever. You can also check out what little progress I make for My Roommate's a Stripper on myroommate'sastripper.tumblr.com. And how about Justin? You can find me at my uh, new resurrected website at mechanicaljustin.com now that I can finally pimp it. And uh, you should probably pre-follow me on Twitch at mechanicaljustin as well since I will probably be live streaming the crap out of video games this weekend. Uh, including City Skylines, probably some Skyrim, uh, and probably some Hearthstone. So uh, come on by and uh, check it out. Nice. Will there be drunken Skyrim or just sober Skyrim? Uh, I don't know yet. We'll see. I'll play it by ear. I do like scotch. That's true. I don't think I'll be drunk, but I'll probably be loopy. It's slightly lubricated. In more ways than one, my friend. Ho! And rounding... <laughs> <laughs> Rounding us out is Calvin. All right. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at CCWII. You can find me on Tumblr at instacal.tumblr.com. And you can find me on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash sounds by Calvin. There you have it. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us for episode 82 of Word Ninjas Live. Come back next Wednesday for episode 83, or just come back daily to see what other crazy shenanigans we post up on YouTube and on our website. Until then, have a good night, everyone. Adios. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.